Je suis désolé, mais je vais euh, tenir ce euh, discours en anglais euh, parce que je me sente plus, plus fort dans cette euh, langue. Euh, dans ce moment, je ne suis pas plus à la catholique, mais à l'Université de Navarre, en Espagne. Euh, et euh, cette, cette analyse, c'était part d'un projet de recherche sur euh, la euh, déradicalisation de la violence contre les non-musulmans dans les courants et dans des aspects de l'histoire musulmane. Cette analyse, c'était un troisième passage. Le premier, il est plus lié à une réconceptualisation de la conquête arabo-pas-musulmane du premier siècle, selon beaucoup de professeurs comme Fred Donner, Robert Hoyland. Il y a la nécessité de reconstruire l'histoire, de reconsidérer l'histoire du premier siècle. Euh, du monde musulman et quand nous, nous, nous parlons de, de la conquête musulmane euh, nous devons parler de conquête arabe parce que dans le premier siècle nous n'avons pas une identité déjà enracinée sur une religion réelle sur une, une analyse de textes coraniques euh, sur une conceptualisation du concept de djihad euh, tous les histoires, tous les auteurs qui vont à écrire sur le djihad sont des auteurs euh, de période de la première euh, 50 années qui ont vécu dans la première euh, année de, de l'Empire abbasside. Après, la deuxième partie c'était plus de mon projet, c'était plus lié au le courant et à le, le verset de l'épée. Et la troisième, c'était lié à la contemporanéité. Et euh, je peux continuer en anglais, oui, bien sûr. Uh, the speech presents an excuse on the historical reason for the absence of a concrete anti-Christian religious narrative uh, before and during the clashes blew up in the Arab Levant during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s of the 19th century, and which affected, in particular, the towns of Aleppo and Damascus. A more contemporary narrative, on the contrary, considers this 19th century early interreligious fight as the first step of an Islamic contemporary supremacist discourse, which has increased the inner region disputes. This analysis, will fo which focuses on five different aspects, underlined, underlines the reason for which this more recent interpretation is purely based on an historical side, as an intellectual discourse, but it is really useful in a contemporary perspective. The first aspect focuses on the Ottoman redistribution of religious sovereignty in the 18th century, uh, the long process of minority rights. It is reported that in 1764, the Sultan allowed the Greek Orthodox and the Armenian patriarchs to inflict direct punishment on troublemakers of their own community, instead of referring these cases to the Ottoman authorities. The Catholic Millet were to obtain the same right in the following decades. Istanbul decrees forbade Kudat from interfering in affairs which fell under local Christian jurisdiction, in particular concerning family law. These concessions, in continuity with Ebu Soud Effendi initiative of a segregationist policy in the 16th century, if it emphasized a clear elf restrained sovereign attitude by the Sultan, allowed prelates and religious minority for the first time to informally expand their jurisdiction without interference from Ottoman authority. These patents, Berat, according to minority leaders, had a direct impact on Sharia law, simplifying reciprocal coexistence between different religious communities. In particular, when in the past, Christians appealed to a Qadi to obtain a juridical response based on Islamic law, which Awiwa could not allow the same petitioner to infringe Christian moral norms. It is therefore clear that 80 years before the modernist Tanzimat, 
the Ottoman legislation was already trying to implement and update a Milad system in which religious differences were evaluated with a more equal segregationist approach. This reform, which clearly did not abolish the jizya or end the discrimination in a possible trial between a Muslim and a Christian, favored a we were a greater freedom of minority of religious community from the domestic perspective of no longer allowing Islamic interference. Finally, it is evident that the Ottoman Empire was trying to redefine its subject status, working in the debate on taqlid and ishtihad, as well as islah and tajdeed, in relation to shape a renewed Muslim identity, but also to allow greater domestic sovereignty for religious minority. This double policy, which will be annihilated by the European post-enlightenment and romantic propensity to forced egalitarianism, disavowed the decadent narrative of the Ottoman 18th century, but at the same time emphasized that minority rights were already changing due to the Ottoman will before the revolutionary impact of Napoleon's campaign. The second aspect focused on the impact of the Tanzimat and the lack of Ottoman sovereignty. In 1841, a firman was drafted in Damascus to allow religious minorities to wear whatever they please, a policy fostering dress equality to subsequently impose a social and political one. As early as 1839, the Gulene Edict was addressed to all Ottoman subjects without religious distinction. But the following one, the 1856 Ferman al-Islahat, was directed to non-Muslims only. It declared the equality of rights for Muslim and non-Muslim subjects, but it preserved the minority economic benefits lower taxation in particular, liberat, acquired with the help of foreign diplomats in the previous decades too. These decrees were prepared with the help of foreign ambassadors and consuls, British, French, and Austrians specifically, highlighting a paradigmatic change which annihilated in a second centuries of Ottoman legislation, weakening the millet system and the traditional Islamic Sharia law on the dhimmi. Assuming a historical comparative perspective in European countries, the British Jewish Naturalization Act of 1753 was not followed until 1829 by the Catholic Emancipation Act, signed after the interreligious civil war of the Elizabeth age in the 16th century between Anglicans and Catholics. In parallel, the Austrian Edict of Tolerance was signed in 1782 whereas a real phase of prosperity for the local Jewish population did not come until the new constitutional improvement following 1848. In France, during the revolution, in the eastern part of the country, Jewish were able to choose their own, own delegates for the first time, while full recognition did not come until 1830, with well-known anti-Semitic cases uh, such as the famous Dreyfus Affair, which broke out at the end of the 19th century. It is quite clear that European powers were imposing on the Sublime Porte the same tolerance act that were trying to achieve with difficulties in their own countries. Before, the Aryan Nazist ideology assumed radical and annihilating policies in the first half of the 20th century but without considering the cultural impact that political and social revolution were having in Western Europe. <coughs> Above all, the enlightenment and the formation of an entrepreneurial bourgeoisie. In parallel, this imposed change would have implemented the historical failure in transforming the tolerance segregationist Ottoman praxis into a discourse on citizenship because the entrepreneurial bourgeoisie that was emerging in the Levant was majorly affiliated to religious minorities than equally balanced in the entire society. The incapability of the Ottoman Empire to go from a long phase of policy of tolerance of religious minorities rooted in the millet system to a real mature egalitarian line with wisely prepared citizenship is one of the great responsibility of European colonialism. 
The Tanzimat policies also caused the elimination of all the fiscal privileges of the ulema and ashraf who were previously exempt from paying taxes. At the same time, the introduction of the levihen mass in the Arab world had an impact on the Muslim community only, while non-Islamic minorities continued not to be enrolled in the army as in previous centuries. The huge difference was that before, religious minority paid the jizya, the poll tax, to not serve the army and to be considered protected. Now the same was abolished antithetically to the Quranic verse, 929, the verse, which institutionalized the same since the Islamic formative age in the 8th century. The lack of Ottoman sovereignty deeply increased the level of malaise, in particular in the majority Arab Muslim population. However, it would be erroneous to consider that all this irritation could be uniquely attributed to foreign powers and religious minorities. The third element uh, that I will briefly analyze, the impact on the urban notable system. Rashid Pasha reforms, in particular after the Egyptian occupation of Syria between 1831 and 1841, strengthened the military control of the urban areas, maintaining a more centralized power of the territory. Schizophrenically, on the other end, on the other side, the Ottoman institutionalization of the Majlis council system highlighted the formation of a traditional urban, cosmopolitan, and interreligious leadership as a powerful tool that would have implemented the urban notables. This instrumental role, which uh, uh, survived to the deflagration of the Ottoman Empire in the First World War, was to last until the independence after the Second World War, and is one of the main reasons, along with European colonialism, for the increasing economic quality in the Levant uh, in the following century. However, as reported by Philip Khoury, our understanding of Druze as Halawi rural elite in the 19th century with Christian merchants and money lenders and their relation with the urban religious minorities in general remain grossly inadequate. The creation of an urban notable system had already begun in the 18th century, as reported by Khuri, Barber, and Schilker. Anyway, after 10 years of Egyptian occupation, Ottomans return imposed a new centralized reforms action, but which coincided with the Tanzimat and the new religious minority rights. After 1860 and the major interreligious clashes, these groups of notables Ulema, Ashraf, Arawat, and a fort composed by merchants, artisans, and Sufi were able to demonstrate how certain events helped mold elements from among them into a fairly local upper class, which will dominate local politics in the Levant from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th. Arawat and Sharifian families appear to better emerge and those belonging to the religious establishment supporting how the ulema were losing ground at the end of the Ottoman Empire, even if more financially supported in the Hamidian phase. However, it seems evident that 1860 interreligious clashes, in particular in Damascus, fortified the secular members of the urban elite underline the increasing weakening of Islamic religious elements, both as a consequence of the Tanzimat policy, then the impact of capitalist development and its secularizing effect. The fourth expert is directly linked with the Aleppo and Damascus case studies and their complexity. The status of protégé was initially attributed only to people who worked for the foreign diplomatic missions, embassies, local consulates. These figures, dragomans, translator, had the same rights, including certain tax exemption, as employees of foreign offices, missionaries, and Western military forces. The abusive right of awarding this status to an increasing number of people was becoming one of the main reasons for frictions. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were 1,500 Russian protégés in the city of Aleppo in relation to a population of around 50,000 people and without considering those of the other foreign countries. 
The conflict between local foreign council and the Ottoman city governors were mostly focused on their inability to obtain information about the real number of these protégés. The British Foreign Office and the French Affaires Etrangères are rich of cases in which foreign figures protected fraudulent financial and economic activities related to local dragomans, a procedure which had an impact on the narrative of the international presence in the Sublime Porte. The fortunes made by religious minorities through trade in with and European textiles, as well as in offering loans with high interest rates, 20, 24%, a riba for Islamic law, to peasants and farmers accumulated Muslim frustration and envy both as an expression of a natural human emotion linked to the clear dishonesty of Christians and Jewish competitors who could better exploit economic convergences. It's not surprising that violent outbursts against minorities, in particular Christians, usually broke out and were fueled in the marketplace. The riots which started in Aleppo, the richest city of Syria, in 1850, and that caused a limited number of casualties, combined the surviving Janissary factions' frustration at having lost every kind of benefit, economic reason linked to the climbing rate of inflation, and the perception of an effective impoverishment. The local government's new interest in counting the city inhabitants, the real casus belli, formed the suspicion that the local Ottoman authorities were moving towards a new military conscription. The most interesting aspect is that if we consider traveler sources from the 18th and 19th century, such as Alexander Russell or Rabbi Hillel, they reports highlight that uh, while the Christians often complain of being singled out by the authorities for oppression, they were in fact no more the target of venial behavior on the part of the city officials than were the Muslims. And what attention they did draw was usually the result of their internal squabbling. But he did add that they were liable to suffer from the insolent petulancy of their Turkish neighbors. This is open to ironic qualification, in particular concerning the clear understanding of this kind of impudence. The frustration of the riot at the beginning, directed at the palace of the governor, Mustafa Zarif Pasha, was who burned the residence gate and did not receive the crowd, was redirected towards the Christian quarters of Judaida and Salibia when the looting and pillage began. The Christians became the target not because they were directly involved in local governor's decision about possible conscription, but due to the increasing emancipation that they had been able to obtain in the last few decades thanks to evident short-term changes, a strong entrepreneurial spirit, and support from the foreign powers. However, as for the Damascus riot in 1860, which caused the death of more than 15 Christians, the United States and Dutch Council included, the targeted Christian population could not be equally considered as reported by Bruce Master in Anne Masso. The local pauperized Muslim population directed its violence in particular toward these apathy arrogant communities that more than others in the previous years had shown their ability in improving the accumulation of wealth and privileges exploiting Muslim impoverishment. The poor Christians of my, in the Maidan quarter in Damascus, on the contrary, were protected by their Muslim neighbors because they had often displayed social and economic solidarity without considering religious lines, assuming anti-governmental and anti-patriarchal positions. On the contrary, the majority of the Christian communities and Catholic institutions in the Damascus quarters of Bab al-Tuma were affected by huge riots, and in Aleppo, the Greek Catholic patriarch Maximus Maslum, was, who had triumphantly entered in the new city diocese in 1849, was violently targeted. Churches, Catholic mission, and the Greek Orthodox patriarchate were primarily targeted as symbolically affiliated with France and Russia the main international opponents of the Ottomans and with the tacit consent of the same. However, at the same time, 
dangerous scoundrels intervene to maximize the mage, hoarding booty and killing. This is by no means an attempt to minimize the anti-Christian clashes and riots in the historical phase of the Ottoman decadence. Mihail Mishaka reports in 1860, a few months after the mob, is a direct testimony of cruelty and barbarism. But we focus on a plurality of factors which were not led by concrete anti-Christian sentiment, as the case of Maidan clearly emphasized, merely a mixture of envy, frustration, inability to be listened by local rulers, as certainly as part of the religious minorities, sense of vengeance and sense of superiority after centuries of their coexistence as protected subjects. Eugenie Rogan's article entitled Sectarianism and Social Conflict in Damascus, the 1860 events reconsidered, compares Mihail Mishaka's different reports. Mihail Mishaka is a member of a Christian family that was victim and testimony of the riots of 1860. The first that was written in 1860, the second in 1873, arguing about the huge differences in the narrative. In the first, which was written for a Western audience, Mishaka portrayed in his, this document the city of Damascus as a town whose history, since the very dawn of Islam, had been marred by conflict between Muslim and Christian. In other words, sectarianism is portrayed as a primordial essential, uh, and essential future of Muslim-Christian relations. Mishaka's report traces the origins of Muslim-Christian division in Damascus to the 7th century Islamic conquest, continuing with the Crusade historical period and as the phase after Napoleon's campaign. The second one, in 1873, was elaborated after a successful Ottoman reassertion of authority in Damascus. The Ottoman official tried to punish those they convinced of involvement in the 1860 events. They paid compensation to the Christian survivors and had more or less completed the reconstruction of the destroyed Christian quarters of Babal Tuma and Babal Sharki in the course of the 60s. With the return of those Muslims exiled for their role in the events in 1866, one of the prime source of Muslim grievance was eliminated. Vigorous new governors in Damascus, such as Mehmet Rashid Pasha, played an important role in reinvigorating both the Ottoman administrative presence and the economic well-being of the city through investment in markets, infrastructure, and rural development. Such measure, by giving all the machine a stake in the new Ottoman order, were important in bridging the deep communal division provoked by 1860 massacres. As Schilker concluded, to a very considerable extent, Ottoman policies in the late 60s and 70s appears to have succeeded in finally consolidating the machine support for the Tanzimat with the help of economic and political incentives. A first prominent example of effective reconciliation policy. Interreligious tension and anti-Christian riots affected the whole Levant of the Levant from the 40s of the, 18th century, of the 19th century. The 1860 Mount Lebanon Civil War centrally played an important role in emphasizing sectarianism within one of the richest and most strategic areas in the Middle East. However, France and England, on the Maronite and Druze side respectively, more than enlightening a real interreligious contrast, underline their mutual economic and political interest to dominate the most fertile and productive enclave in the region. The fight against the feudal Lebanon mountain system, led by figures such as Tanius Shaheen, was to have implemented the French and the Maronite clerical powers to develop a religious national homeland, which was to play a significant role in the history of the future Lebanon. On the Druze side, on the contrary, England and the Ottoman Empire were able to redirect the peasants' anti-feudal riots against the Maronite farmers, using religious conflict to preserve their feudal system. As well as, in more recent times, interreligious violence has often been adopted to forge and shift 
the attention from more practical and political and monetary reason. Finally, the lack of an Islamic supremacy discourse. There is a lack of a religious anti-minority narrative within 18th century as within early Arab Nahda. Is emphasized considering the total different authors of the 18th and of the 19th century. As Abd al al Nabulusi, who is on the contrary famous to have already compared de facto Muslim and non Muslim rights one century before the Tanzimat, and to have also supported an afterlife interreligious shared salvation theological approach. Ahmad al Damanuri, who elaborated a fatwa in trying to limit the Copt church reconstruction and restoration in Egypt but without a real concrete impact. Muhammad al-Murtada al-Rabidi, Abd al-Rahman al-Jabarti, Muhammad al-Shawqani, and the same Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab, who in his, in his writing used Christian and Jewish believers, emphasizing the corruption of their revelation and their associationist policies as example for Muslim target, to bring Islamic Ummah outside heterodox praxis and belief. The long historical for 18th, 19th century debate on taqlid and ishtiyad is prominently immersed in a common Islamic religious intellectual needs, in which the kufr debate focuses exclusively on belonging to Islam and not the side of the non-Muslim minority. After Napoleon's campaign, the early Arab authors of the Nada, as Arifa, Rafi al-Takhtawi, Hayreddin Pasha, as young Ottomans as Namik Kemal, Ali Suavi, Ibrahim Sinashi, were majorly concentrated on the political and religious reason for Islamic decadence, as on post-enlightenment necessary cooperation on society equality without any trace of religious supremacy discourse. However, the Damascus clashes on 1860s as others anti-Christian insurgencies in the same historical phase, as not directly involved within the Druze Maronite war, emphasize that the human factor based on the Muslim lower and middle classes loss of the sort of superiority which they all and individually exercised over and against the other religious groups deeply affected discourse, emphasizing an anti-Christian assumption based on uh, materialistic and economic reasons, certainly not spiritual ones. And I reach the conclusion. The lack of an anti-Christian narrative of wars a jihadist one before the Aleppo or the Damascus riots in the 19th century, the case of Christians in Damascus Maidan quarter, as the Algerian Abd al-Qadir intervention to save many members of the Hahal Kitab, emphasized the lack of violence based on religious concrete reason, while giving attention to the plurality of factors previously reported with a shared balance of responsibility by all the actors involved, European countries and autumn domestic policies. As the European powers had no influence in the administration of Damascus after the pogrom of 1860, Mishaka's second reports of 1873 did not elaborate his work for European audiences, nor did he use the European language of sectarianism. The Christian of Damascus had an important stake in communal harmony in 1873, as the language of Mishaka's following book reflects this. The tone is conciliatory, assigning some of the blame to the Christian victims and celebrating those Muslim notables who rescued Christians from the mob. Most remarkable of all is the tone of submission to government authority with which Mishaka closed his history. With the reassertion of the Tanzimat reforms, Christian notables like Mishaka had every interest in asserting loyalty and filthy to the Ottoman state and not to upset communal relation when Christian enjoy the same legal standing as Muslim. Thank you so much for your attention.